Hello, good morning and welcome back. I'm Grace. I'm Lydia. And together, of course, we're Everything with the Girls, the podcast that discusses all things true crime and spooky. I think we're due some more spooky stuff. Yeah, that's true. I'm very... I'm... I'm recording like in my bed because I'm a lazy bitch and I'm very conscious that it's actually echoey now that I've started talking. No, you but... I'm on the squeaky chair again, so we're not on, we're not on form this week. You but know what? You know what? It's, none you of you, lot, none it. of you, none of you pay us for this. Okay, exactly. so you can deal with the <laughs> none of you, Claire and Duncan. Hiya. <laughs> yeah. My dad was talking to me about it yesterday. He was like, um, he's like, I like the podcast. I said, oh yeah. <laughs> I said, we're doing James... Oh, sorry, sport. We're doing James Bulger today. And I said to him, we're doing James Bulger. And he was like, oh, <laughs> not sure about that one. I thought, yeah. yeah. I said it to my sister. She's like, oh, I don't think I'd listen to that. I was like, you're never fucking listening anyway, Charlotte. <laughs> no, I know. Um, so obviously today we're discussing a case that I'm sure everyone in the world knows about. Um, it's the 1993 murder of James Bulger in Merseyside. As I'm sure most of you are aware, this crime exceeds itself in notoriety and fame. But before we get into it, it's very important to just say that listener discretion is advised. This is obviously a horrific crime involving children. Um, there's no doubt about that. And it's very gruesome. Not very nice. No. Obviously, people love to listen to true crime. But I'll be I'll, I'll accept it if this is too much for some of you to listen to. Oh, yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Like... This is the thing, right? I can listen to true crime cases till I'm blue in the face about like gory shit, like beheadings, all that sort of stuff. But when kids are involved, I'm like, oh, I might have to tap I know, out. yeah. Yeah. And I think it makes it so much worse because of like it was children that did it as well. Yeah. And like for me personally, I just, I find it, I don't know if intimidating is the right word, but like, because of where I am from and where I live, I'm like twenty minutes, thirty minutes away from where it happened. Mm, like, yeah, it, it's very, it's heavy. It's the only way to describe mm. it. It's heavy, and maybe that's a northern thing. <laughs> no, it is definitely a heavy, you know heavy I mean? crime. Like, but yeah. we've got some of them coming up because I feel like some of the ones that we've been doing recently, like that, it's good that they're quick and they're like short, snappy ones, but also like. Sometimes you just want some detail. Like, yeah. we know why you're here. Yeah. But, I yeah. mean, to be fair, the past couple of weeks we've done it kind of short because mainly my fault, really, because I haven't been able to, like, focus for too too long. Um, mm. But, yeah, I do, I do love a long case. I do yeah. love it. Um, I don't love it when I'm editing it, though, I'll be honest. <laughs> No, that's true. I think maybe that's if we ever get any bigger and we can hire someone, that's the first first port of call. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously, editing's one thing. The researching as well. It takes me like two days to research yeah. places like this. Yeah. Yes. I mean, so if, much anyone, if anyone listening is very skilled in editing, not even that skilled because I can do it, so you don't even <laughs> need to be that skilled, but know yeah, what you're doing skilled. and you want to like just. We can't pay you, but we'll we'll you can provide coffee game. and snacks. You can yeah. join our group chat. Yeah, we'll. Uh, I'll deliver you some snacks to you for while you're editing. That can be payment, right? That's legal. Yeah. Um. So yeah, obviously, listen to discretion is advised. But let's get into it, shall we? Yes. If we have to. James Patrick Bulger was born on the 16th of March 1990 and he was murdered just one month before his third birthday in 1993. It was a murder that truly shocked Britain and continues to be one of Britain's most famous and brutal murders. On Friday the 12th of February 1993, James was with his mother Denise shopping in the New Strand Shopping Centre in Bootle Merseyside. Whilst inside the A.R. Tim's Butcher's shop on the lower floor, at around 3.40pm, Denise, who had been distracted within the shop, realised her son was missing. What starts off as a simple hunt for a missing child turns into something sinister when, by Friday night, he's still not been found. 
The police and security staff worked through the night at the Strand Shopping Centre to sift through the CCTV footage. I can never say that. It's like CCTV. Their efforts were rewarded when they pinpoint James leaving the butcher's shop earlier that day. Tracking his movements, the police search for further clues. They confirmed that the moment after James is seen exiting the butchers, a panic-stricken Denise also leaves the shop and is seen on the ground floor hunting for her son. Unbeknown to her, James is now on the top floor and appears to be following two boys. The footage reveals the haunting grainy image of the last recorded moments of James Bulger. This is probably the image everyone sees in their head. Yeah, like, definitely, 100%. It's like the main image of the whole case. Um, yeah. If you haven't seen it, I'll put it on the Instagram. Like, just, yeah. You know what really gets me, and I'm not gonna, like, add this in, but he looks so much like Max. Mm. And it, like... He does, he's such a like, cute oh, baby as well, yeah. <sighs> James can be seen holding the hand of one boy and another boy leading the way just in front of them both. They are heading towards the exit in the direction of the Leeds Liverpool Canal. Two days later, on the 14th of February, the police and James's family have tried everything to find him. Patrol cars have been used with loudspeakers, press confer- conferences have been called appealing for the two boys in the Strand Shopping Centre to come forward and a manhunt is underway, searching for the nearby canals and wasteland areas. Hope for a happy ending disappears when a young boy rushes in to Walton Lane Police Station and announces a body has been found on the railway tracks, less than 150 yards from the back of the police station. What the police discover horrifies the nation. So, this is where it gets a bit gory and gruesome and horrible, so feel free to skip ahead or not listen. It's not just Mom? Oh. There's okay, not the the, the actual details aren't just yet. I kept them in later on. Okay, well it's you've got it's your warning horrible. later on. Yeah, it's still horrible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Preemptive warning. So, James's body um, had been cut in half by a train. He had been clearly tortured before his death. He would sustained ten skull fractures and forty-two separate injuries to his head, face, and body. There was, according to the pathologist. Just no definitive way to say which injury ended James's life, so the official cause of death was murder by beating. After James's murder, emotions among the Liverpool community were running high. On the bank, close to where his body had been found, hundreds of flowers were placed. Among them was a bunch of flowers put there by one of James's murderers. Wow, well, did not know that. With the public support in trying to catch the killer, the only the one thing that the police aren't short of is information. On Tuesday the 16th of February, they arrested a young boy to bring him for questioning. This becomes breaking news. However, neighbours who have seen the police arrive jump to the wrong conclusion. Believing that he's guilty, a near riot ensues. The level of anger that someone could commit such a brutal and savage murder has increased the... Li- has incensed? Incensed, yeah. The like Liverpool they're community. Just, they can't, like, so, comprehend. I don't yeah. know complicated words. <laughs> As soon as the innocent boy and his family are ruled out of the inquiry, they are forced to move house. The breakthrough came when a woman, on seeing slightly enhanced images of the two boys on national television, recognised John Venables, whom she knew from had played truant with Robert Thompson on the day that James went missing. She contacted the police and the two boys were arrested and questioned by the police. The police act on this information and plain clothed policemen in unmarked cars went to arrest them. Robert Thompson was 10 years old and lived in Walton with his mother and two younger brothers. His four older brothers had all been taken into care. When the police arrived, they realised his house isn't far from the murder scene. John Venables was also 10. His parents divorced when he was three years old and together they shared joint custody of him and his two siblings. When he appeared at the top of the stairs, the police were astounded by the young age and small stature of John. The police were certain that the boys they've just arrested aren't who they're looking for. They strongly believe that children aren't capable of such a crime. I mean, like... You do, though, don't you? That's, I think that's what, yeah. That's why this case is such a big shock factor, because you would never have thought that these two... Ten? Ten-year-olds are tiny. I know. But it's like, that's probably one of the biggest mistakes police and anyone could make, is like, oh, well, they just can't... They can't have done it. 
Yeah. No, if the evidence is pointing there. It's funny, isn't it? Because you always talk about being... um, Prove you have to be proven guilty, mm. but it's almost like, well, no, they're just innocent. Like, yeah, like even when it's proven, yeah, you go. it's like the whole Lizzie Borden thing. They couldn't possibly believe a woman could do that. Like, That's stop making assumptions. It's, it's like, a really negative way, actually, to think about stuff because it's the same when you think about like, um, like women couldn't possibly rape, yeah, or all men yeah. are guilty of rape, or yeah. all men are guilty of domestic violence. It's like yeah. really bad to stereotype people in that way, but I mean, yeah, it because happens, it, it it take it like I personally think it disrespects the victim as well, like mm. because you're giving excuses to someone based on their sex, and it's like no, yeah. you can't. Yeah, there's a there's a reason you have to go off evidence, mm. like physical and forensic and stuff like that. You can't go off circumstantial evidence or like word by mouth that sort of thing. Like, yeah, it's bad if you think about it. Yeah. yeah. Thompson had been taken to Walton Lane Police Station, and Venables had found himself in Liverpool's Lower Lane Police Station. I'm not entirely sure where Lower Lane is, but I'm pretty sure like it's practically opposite sides of the city. But also, yeah, they're in different police stations, so... Yeah. there's no way they mix in or anything like that. Yeah. yeah. Both boys have samples of their blood, hair and fingernails taken, which is standard when someone's taken into custody, isn't it? Like Biometrics. Yeah. Yes. I learned that. <laughs> that's what I was, yeah, that's what I was going to tell you before. I thought, she's only going to kill me if I just try and like, mansplain and this to her. I was not in the mood. I was in a bad mood earlier today, guys, I'll tell you. <laughs> The fact that the suspects are so young came to a shock to the investigating officers, headed by Detective Superintendent Albert Kirby of Merseyside Police. Early press reports and police statements had referred to James as being seen with two youths, which then suggested that the killers were teenagers. The ages of the boys were obviously difficult to ascertain from the images captured by the CCTV. And if you see the photo, it is kind of obvious, like... I feel yeah, like they that look when, short, you, when but... you look at it with hindsight, yeah. they are obviously they're children, but like before, you, yeah, they could quite easily be 15, 16. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like you get short 15 year olds. I fucking grow yeah. up with them. Like, yeah, don't I know it? I something in the water up here. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have many tall people until they're like in their 20s. <laughs> but no one could have imagined that the two boys would only be 10 years old themselves and therefore the country's youngest killers for the last 250 years. I was thinking when, when you read that, I was like, what about Mary Bell? But she was 11, so they, ju- they just beat her. They just wow. beat her. Yeah, that's mad, isn't it? I know. I know. 10 is just so young. <sighs> it, and this is like a question that everyone's asked and you're never going to get an answer, but it, it's literally like, how do two, year, two 10-year-olds get to that point? I thought you were just going to say that. This is like the classic case for nature versus nurture. Mm. But they both had different upbringings. Well, yeah, I mean, we'll get into that later a little bit. But it's more... When you talk about John Venables and Robert Thompson, like, when this came out, I don't know if they were trying to, like, fear-monger everyone or what, but, it like, people really focused on violent video games, um, pornography... Like, apparently, John Venable's mum was a prostitute. But all these things ended up... Like, a lot of them were true, but some of them were, like, debunked. Yeah, I don't I don't know if it was necessarily, like, people were genuinely being, like, you need to ban this, blah, blah. I think it was more the fact that... They were looking for so, reasons yeah, why these Yeah, it's so incomprehensible it, that someone could do this, mm. yeah. Like, that anyone could do this to a two-year-old. But the fact that they were children themselves, like, it's... There's, you can't understand it. Hmm. as much information as you get to try and understand it and like psychological theories all that sort of thing there's no way to comprehend someone doing that yeah. a child doing that like but they did yeah. like yeah it's just yeah <sighs> it's pretty deep yeah uh the police were entering new territory with this investigation and no one had ever interviewed ch- child murder suspects before to ensure their testimonies would stand up in court, it was important that the two boys understood the implications of telling lies and telling the truth, and know the differences between right and wrong. Asking specific questions to prove these facts, they both passed. 
So the questioning continued and began. Both young boys had their mothers present along with legal representation. However, they both coped very differently during police questioning. Venables acted his young age. He was hysterical and extremely scared of the investigators. He kept revealing his deep-rooted fears of being sent to prison. Um, but Thompson, on the other hand, is controlled and mostly composed throughout the whole process. Venables was quick to reveal that he had been in the area on the day that James disappeared, but he never mentioned the Strand's shopping centre. Thompson eventually reveals that they were both at the Strand and went on to describe in detail the clothes that James was wearing. The police were totally perplexed as to why a boy of 10 would know that information. They, it wasn't public knowledge. Mm. You couldn't even really see it on the CCTV footage. No one knows. Like, no, no. The yeah. CCTV, is, it's like brown and black, yeah. really, when you look at it. This was one of Thompson's major slip-ups as it revealed that James had been with the boys for a very long time. They always slip up in the end. Always. Especially 10-year-olds, though. I feel yeah. like... Kids if lie. You're, like you could like, be a psycho. Like you could be a psychopath at ten. There's no question yeah, about that. But like, and you could be capable of murder. Obviously, we're talking about it. But you're still a stupid kid. Yeah. This is the thing. Like, you kids still can't lie, lie to me. Is, yeah, yeah you it's can't what lie they to do. A grown up. If they think they're gonna get shouted at for anything, they're gonna lie. Like that's yeah. just what it is. So doesn't matter how many that, how many horror means, films you've watched. Yeah. For him to say that, it means that he's. Although he seems calm on the outside, he's like freaking the fuck out. Like, so he slips up. Like, and it's, I don't necessarily mean that he's like this criminal mastermind and would never slip up or anything like that. But like, it is a small detail that you're not really going to think anyone's going to think anything of it. You get it a lot in murder cases. You know, people, they know just a little bit too much and they know things that weren't in the news. And there's no other way for you to have known that yeah. other than you are guilty. Yeah, yeah. So it's obviously, the... eventually, Thompson confessed, and the two boys um, admitted to taking James from the shopping centre. I like, so I watched. So I, I told you, didn't I? There was a, a short film based on this, mm. and it was. It's only thirty minutes long, and it was nominated for an Oscar in two thousand eighteen. Really? Oh, and is it a new thing? Yeah, you can get it on YouTube. It's very controversial. Like, right. very controversial. Because, I mean, I can understand why it's controversial, but, like, I think people get the wrong impression from it. So, yeah. the 30 minutes is just the interviews of the two boys. Oh. And the script of it is the transcripts from the interviews. So, it's not mm. like someone's wrote a script about it and it is dramatising it or anything. It's purely based on the recordings. Mm. So the acting by... I have to say, these two little boy actors are fucking phenomenal. <laughs> like, honestly, like... But I had to turn it off after about 10 minutes because it's just disturbing to watch. Like... Yeah. And people... people It's controversial because people are like, oh, you're just trying to humanise the boys and all this, blah, 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 like, sympath trying to sympathise. And it's like, it's not... It's not trying to sympathise. It's trying to show what the interviews and stuff was. And the fact that it mm. is disturbing, like... I personally don't think it's Oscar-worthy, but... <laughs> <laughs> I think it was... It was in a, a different festival and f those films from that festival are automatically put into the running for Oscars mm. or something like that from what I saw so it's not like it is but it's hard it, though isn't it I think especially for people that have children because you the idea that a child could be like could do something like this is just horrible yeah so I think you like they look for reasons why they did it don't they and they like like you said they humanize them because they kind of pin the blame on the parents or their upbringing mm. or whatever because they think god forbid that actually a 10 year old is just capable of doing something like yeah. this yeah but and i the biggest thing that i saw was the fact that james's parents weren't consulted for this mm. they weren't they had no idea this was happening mm. but i'm not sure whether they had to know because the interviews are purely the scenes uh it's it's almost like a crime watch type thing. So the scenes isn't there a thing as well where like once so much time has gone past, it's kind of public domain. 
I don't know. But this is a thing. So the scenes are the two interview rooms with the boys in, like obviously separately getting interviewed. And then the rest of it is like the CCTV footage. And then there are some reenactments, but like they don't show the little boy or anything like that. Like the little boy actor Mm. playing James. So I'm not sure whether like, obviously out of, for morale, um, I can't say the word, good morals, whatever. Like, it's in better taste to warn the family that you're doing this. Yeah. And the the director came out and said, I don't think I needed to. And if mm. I had, they probably would have said no anyway. So, and I think that's kind of... anyway. It. Yeah, so that's kind of, that's in bad taste. Like, it's definitely, mm. like, something I'd be pissed off at, like... Yeah, definitely. But, yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't personally recommend watching it because it is quite disturbing and i haven't seen the whole thing like but you know it's on youtube so yeah it's do what you want like but just the fact that it's just the transcripts was enough for me to be like oh fuck like this Mm. isn't a movie like i don't know i feel like when you watch movies about even if they're true crime murders you can sort of like take a step back from it still do you know what i mean Mm. Not that it's fiction, but, like, you probably know it's dramatised in some ways. So you're not going to get that disturbed by it. But this was, like, oh, God. Mm. Yeah. So that's that, anyway. Back to it. Love a good little side note, don't I? The police had a hard time during the interviews, as getting a story straight was proving tricky. Both boys blamed each other for the things and doing their best to hide the truth. Again, as children do. Yeah. Like, you have to remember, (laughs) these are children. Like, they're pointing the finger back and forth, all sorts. Mm. Like, I know we've seen with other um, suspects and things, they are, they point the finger and stuff, but, like, even kids, like, they're going to do it to a whole different level, aren't they? Mm. Thompson's testimony changed on five separate points over the course of two days of questioning. However, when Venables asked if you could get fingerprints off skin, that obviously set alarm bells ringing for the police, as it's going to. It's like, what did Mary Bell ask? She asked something as well, didn't she? And even then it took them aback, because it's like, why is a child asking this? Yeah, we don't even expect an adult to ask that? this. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's like the fact that they're asking it, they don't understand the, like, the weight of the question. Like... It was obvious to the police that the boys had been hiding something. The police started to notice a pattern in Thompson's chatter. Whenever he started talking about James, his anxiety caused him to fidget and start shuffling his legs. Body language. It's going to tell you more than words, Will. (laughs) I'm telling you. By lunchtime on Friday, the 19th of February, Thompson admitted that they'd taken James to the railway line. During the investigation, there was an eerie moment when Thompson imitated a wailing James asking for his mother. Oh, I just got shivers. That is fucked, isn't it? Oh, my God. Understandably, the investigating officers found it incredibly unnerving, as we are right now as well. Nearing 1pm that same day, Benables found himself alone with his parents. It's at this point that he couldn't take it anymore. He broke down and confessed to being involved in the murder. The police were listening to everything, of course. And with this revelation, they could now properly interrogate Thompson. He refused to admit his guilt in James's death, but police felt that they had enough evidence against both the suspects. Forensic tests confirmed that both boys had the same blue paint on their clothing that was found on James's body. Both had blood on their shoes, the blood on Thompson's shoe was a match to James's DNA. A pattern of bruising on James's right cheek matched the features of the upper part of the shoe worn by Thompson. A paint mark with the shoe cap of one of Venable's shoes indicated that he must have used some force when kicking James. Thompson said to have asked police whether the two-year-old had been taken to hospital to, quote, get him alive again. Oh, The boys were charged with the murders of James Bulger on the 20th of February 1993 and appeared at the South Sefton Youth Court on the 22nd of February where they were remanded in custody to await trial. 
In the aftermath of their arrest and throughout the, immediate, the media accounts of their trial, the boys were referred to as Child A and Child B due to their incredibly young age. That's like something they do a lot of the time, isn't it? They'll, yeah, like, they would have done that though, wouldn't they? Yeah, if they're under 18, I think, they're yeah. um, always going to refer to them as like Child A, Child B, that sort of thing. Mm. Up to 500 protesters gathered at South Sefton Magistrates Court during the boys' initial court appearances. The parents of the accused were moved to different parts of the country and assumed new identities following extensive death threats. I mean, you can imagine. Even that boy that was innocent at the beginning. I know. I know. The full trial opened at Preston Crown Court on the 1st of November 1993. Conducted as an adult trial with the accused in the dock away from their parents and the judges and court officials in legal regalia. Just remember these boys are 10 years old and although the ages of criminal responsibility in the UK is technically 10, the law also states that children between 10 and 17 are dealt with by youth courts and here these boys are in an adult crown court trial away from their parents. Mm. I mean... I'm obviously I'm not team Venables and Thompson but no. there's some breaches in human rights there for sure yeah like it, it doesn't matter who it is whether they're children or adults what they're still entitled to a fair trial so like, what's interesting is that in 1999 the European Crown Court of Human Rights ruled that by being tried as an adult the boys uh, right to a fair trial had actually been breached so they did acknowledge it it's actually going to cause more trouble than it's worth, isn't it? Yeah, if you and don't it actually it. ended up making the case and the trial even more controversial and infamous than it already was. Yeah, because like that that's the sort of thing that can get cases thrown out yeah. and convictions thrown out. So like, yeah. you're doing this to get justice for the victim and his family, but you're also fucking with that justice Yeah, because it's like doing stages you... like this. The crime was so heinous and horrible. You want to trial them as seriously as you can, but actually, you're breaching their human rights, and you're making your yes. If they had been, I don't know whether this has an effect on it, but if they had been tried in a youth court, does mm. that affect the sentencing compared to in an adult court? Yeah, pro- well, it- I would imagine so. I don't. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. 100% sure but I no, would imagine I don't know. I've never in really seen court, that you're that more as an likely aspect. to get you're probably more likely to get um like youth offend like youth institutes and stuff like that's that that's what they were, yeah that's what they were sent to anyway so yeah yeah I just I wasn't sure maybe that's why they chose the adult court because I don't know like I don't know if they were just trying to make a point like uh, yeah, I don't know, and I guess they kind of thought, well, no no one's going to fight back for these children, like, they did this horrible thing. Yeah. But, I mean, yeah. Yeah. So the boys denied the charges of murder, abduction, and attempted abduction, even though they admitted it. Cool. Yeah. Makes sense. And there was evidence of it. <laughs> so, obviously, they murdered and abducted James, but it actually emerged on the 12th of February... The same day that they abducted a murder James at around 12.30, the boys had tried to abduct a different boy from the same shopping centre. The mother spotted her son and daughter playing with the two boys, and while paying for her shopping, she realised her son was missing. As she ran outside, she saw the same two boys calling her son to follow them, um, and she screamed his name and he returned. During the trial, she remembers overhearing Thompson and Venables saying, we'll take one of those. So, obviously, can you imagine being that boy? I know. I know. I mean, even being that mother and then knowing, like, what then happened. What they did later. Yeah. Like, it's just, there were so many stages, and we'll get on to it, but there were so many stages that day where they could this could have been prevented. Yeah, well, I was thinking, I was just about to say that, but actually, would you do anything because it's just two 10 year olds playing with your like kid it's just kids playing with kids no i mean all the stuff that we get onto in a minute yeah Um, but you know what i mean because immediately my thought was why didn't she report them to security but actually they're just kids no but i wouldn't necessarily have a question as to them playing together because that's what kids do isn't it but if Mm. they're trying to lead my child away when they know where i am I'd be like, where are your mothers? Because they are only ten. They only they look. I think someone said that they looked younger than ten as well. Mm. Um, I'd be well, like, where, where's like, your mom? 
No, you know I know, but I, like, like, I think one of the police officers was. It said that he was even taken aback by just how short and like how small he was. Like, so yeah, he said that about you, Venables. Yeah, yeah you're even going to think that they're maybe younger than that. So you, mm. I would personally be like, "Where's your mum? Like, why are you two on your own? Like, in this in this like short movie that I watched, they were wearing school uniforms as well, and I'd be like, "Why mm. why are you in the school uniform, but you're not in school? Like, where's your mother?" Yeah, you know what I mean, like, mm. especially the fact that they just try to lead that my child away. I'd be like, "What is going on?" Mm. But what's done is done, isn't it? I'm not saying like it's the hair fault or anything like that. No, no, just no. Mad, of course it, not. Like? But it's just like you know when you look back and it's there's so many what ifs and times that it could yeah. have been different. But yeah. So each boy sat in view of the courts on raised chairs. They needed to be raised so they could actually see out of the dock because they were obviously in an adult court. And they were tiny. And they were tiny. They were both accompanied by a social worker. Although they were separated from their parents, they were within touching distance of their families when they attended the trial. Yeah, so it's not like their parents went in there that they couldn't see, it's just that they couldn't sit with them. Like, Yeah. So at the trial, the lead prosecution counsel, Richard Henriquez QC, successfully disproved the principle of Dolly in capax. I think that's how you pronounce it. It's Latin. Yeah. This is it's the presumption that children cannot be held legally responsible for their actions because they're children. Um, I guess he managed to rebuke this because both boys were of age to take legal criminal responsibility. So they have the capability of understanding their actions. Yeah. Because I think they, they kind of tried to use the principle of Dolly in capax as... They sh- maybe these children should have just counselling or I don't know like yeah. a lesser sentence than actually what they're going to but actually they said no you're 10 you're criminally responsible so I think the fact that the that. investigating officers as well brought in the psychiatri- psychiatrist so early to determine whether they were okay mm. to be interviewed at the least um, that had a massive thing on it as well because if they hadn't done that then it would be like oh well these boys need mm. um attention like mental attention like this isn't okay blah 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 all that sort of so i think the fact that the police did that that sort of just like set it all in being like oh actually they know what they did they know right from wrong like Mm. let's move forward thompson and venables uh were considered by the court to be capable of mischievous discretion which meant that they had the ability to act with criminal intent as they were mature enough to understand that what they were doing was seriously wrong because there's a difference between punching your brother in the face mm. and torturing a strange, yeah. strangest child. Yeah. Why did you um, look at me tra- then when you said punching your brother in the face? Well, I just think. <laughs> do you remember you always used to be like, well, you know, when they're like, when they're like, oh, like, you know, I used to fight with my brother all the time. You think, God, everyone used to do that. Yeah. But. Yeah, it's like fighting with your siblings is totally different than fighting with strangers or like hundred percent kids who aren't your family. I mean, child... not to say that this would have been any better if they were related, but like I just like, it is, <laughs> yeah, it is different. I mean, yeah. Um, a child psychiatrist, Eileen Vizard, who interviewed Thompson before the trial, was asked in court whether he would know the difference between right and wrong. That it was wrong to take a young child away from his mother and that it was wrong to cause injury to a child. Vizard replied by saying, if the issue is on the balance of probabilities, I think I can answer with certainty. So she's basically saying, if you're asking me if it's possible that Thompson could comprehend that his actions are wrong, I'm going to tell you that he definitely knew they were wrong. Hmm. Vizard also said that Thompson was suffering from PTSD after the attack on James. Susan Bailey, the home office forensic psychiatrist who interviewed Venables, said unequivocally that he knew the difference between right and wrong. I mean, the fact that he freaked out so much even at the start of the interview, like, that just tells you he knows something's wrong. Like, he knows something he's done is wrong. I mean, you can see it. Venables Venables is, like, panicking, worried. Thompson has got all those anxious tics and twitching. But he's almost, like, sat there in shock a little bit as well. Like, yeah. Like, obviously, I feel like they he, have PTSD. Yeah, like, but I also feel like he he thought he got away with it. Like, it, like, I don't know. Like, I feel like anything I say towards it is going to be like, oh, he's this criminal mastermind. That's not what I mean. Like, it's, I don't know. It's just odd for a child to act like that. Like, 
it's almost like the way Venables acted, like the fact that he was so panicky is more normal. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like it's more... I don't know. Thompson just freaked me the fuck out. I'll just say that. Like, he was too calm. Like Mary Bell. Mm. Like, too calm about that situation. Mm. Like, she was the same, wasn't she? She was like, okay, I'm charged. Let's go. See you Mm. later. Like... Thompson Venables didn't speak during the trial, and the case against them was based to a large extent on more than 20 hours of tape recorded in police interviews with the boys, which were played back in court. Venables mentioned in his recorded police interview that it was their intention to find a child and throw them into the path of an oncoming bus or taxi on the road outside the shopping centre. They wanted the death to look like an accident. Thompson was considered to have taken the lead in, leading role in the abduction process, although it was Venables who had apparently initiated the idea of taking James to the railway line. And in the famous still shot of the CCTV, it's Venables that is holding James's hand as they walk out of the shopping centre. And since this trial and murder, it's only Venables who, since the crime happened, has continually committed disgusting and horrendous acts of criminality, which we'll get onto later. Yeah. During the trial, it became clear what transpired of the day of James's abduction. CCTV evidence showed Thompson and Venables casually observing the child, apparently selecting the target. Throughout the day, Thompson and Venables were seen stealing items including sweets, a doll, batteries and blue paint. One of the boys revealed that they're, in their confession tapes that they were planning to find a child, abduct them, lead them to the busy road alongside the shopping centre and push them into oncoming traffic, which is, yeah, what I just said. I don't know why I put that in earlier, but yeah. The two boys spotted James and took him by the hand, leading him out of the shopping centre at around 3.42pm. James was taken to the Leeds Liverpool Canal, around a quarter of a mile away from the shopping centre, where he was dropped on his head and suffered injuries to his face. The boys joked about pushing him into the canal, but decided to take him somewhere else. During this two and a half mile walk across Liverpool, the boys were seen by 38 people, but most bystanders did not nothing to intervene, and those who did were silenced with claims that James was their younger brother. I mean, it does make sense, like, why wouldn't you? But even then, because they now look so I think young, about still it. be why why the th- why the three of you on your own? Like now, I think about it. He's been dropped on his head, mm. so he's probably bleeding. Mm. So, I, like, part of me thought, like, oh, you would just believe that, wouldn't you? Because why would a child lie mm. about abducting well, a child? But also, he's bleeding. Like, where are your parents? I mean, even in one of these scenes, they're sat on like the edge of a like a green and uh, a, a estate, a housing estate. And this old lady comes over and she can obviously see like the bruise and the cut on James's head. And she's saying, what's, what's happened there? Why is he crying? And they're like, oh, we just found him at the bottom of the hill. Like, we're going to take him to this, the police station now. She's like, what happened to his head? He's like, oh, he was like that when we found it. She's like, all right, take him along. Take him to the police station now. Why are you not going with, like, if you know this, this baby is on its own... Mm-hmm. Why are you leaving that responsibility to two young children? Two children, yeah, like, yeah, totally agree. You're like an 80 year old woman. Take them by the hand, the three of them. Take them all to the police station and say, "This mm-hmm. is what happened." Boys, tell the police what happened. Like, ugh, I hate, like, I hate busybodies, but I also hate when they when they need to be busybodies. Like, yeah, if you're gonna be, be a busybody, do it right. Exactly, do it at the right times. <laughs> <laughs> The boys eventually arrived at the village of Walton. They led James up the steep bank to a railway line near Walton and Anfield railway station, where they then began torturing him. So I wasn't sure we were going to put this in, but it looks like we are. So if you don't want to listen to this part, you should skip. And if you don't want to listen to it, uh, good luck to you, because I have to fucking say it now. Like, Do you want me to say it? No, it's all right. I just got to get out of the way, aren't I? Come on. Okay, so one of the boys threw paint, which had, they had shoplifted earlier, into James's left eye. They had kicked him, stamped on him, and threw bricks and stones at him. Batteries were placed in James's mouth, and according to reports, they were also inserted into him. Finally, the boys dropped a 22-pound iron bar, described as a railway fish plate, on James. 
He sustained 10 skull fractures and also around 40 other injuries. Alan Williams, the case's pathologist, stated that James had so many injuries it was impossible to isolate the fatal blow. Thompson and Venables laid James across the tracks and weighed his head down with rubble and tied him down in the hope that the train would hit him and make his death look like an accident. Police suspected that there was also a sexual element to the crime, since James' shoes, socks and trousers had been removed. When James and Venables were questioned about this aspect of the attack by detectives and a child psychiatrist, the pair were reluctant to give details, but also denied inserting some batteries into James. At, the, at his eventual parole, J- Venables psychiatrist Susan Bailey reported that visiting and revisiting the issue with John as a child, and now as an adolescent, he gives no account of any sexual element to the offence. They did other stuff, which I'm not going to include in here because it's fucking horrendous. Mm. This little boy, when he went to say he was tortured, is an understatement. Mm. Like, and it's even worse because they don't know at what point he died. Yeah. Because so much was done to him. Mm. So it just makes... Like, my mouth's gone all dry because it's just, like, fucking horrendous. <laughs> okay. Lawrence Lee, who was the solicitor of Venables during the trial, later said that Thompson was one of the most frightening children he had ever seen and compared him to the Pied Piper. According to newspapers at the time, Venables was accompanied everywhere by his mother and father, Susan and Neil. In police interviews, Susan is said to have cried for hours, destroyed Venables' confession, stating that Venables, quote, did like to be liked and loved to have friends and he has got involved with the wrong person. According to reports, Thompson came from a far less stable family home. He was the fifth out of seven children. Thompson's dad is said to have abandoned the family in 1988, leaving Thompson's mum, Anne, devastated and eventually turning to drink and depression. It's also alleged that Anne attempted suicide numerous times before Thompson was found guilty for the murder of James. After his appearances in court, Venables would often strip his clothes and say that he can smell James on them. The prosecution admitted a number of exhibits during the trial, including a box of 27 bricks, a bloodstained stone and the railway fish plate. The pathologist spent 33 minutes outlining the injuries sustained by James, many of those to his legs. Brain damage was extensive and included a hemorrhage. The trial judge, Mr Justice Morland, stated that exposure to violent video games might have encouraged the actions of Thompson and Venables, but this was disputed by David McLean, the Minister of State at the Home Office at the time. He pointed out that police had found no evidence to link the case to violent video games. They had um, reviewed, like, I think, I don't know if it, say, it says here... But like over 200 of the family's rentals and stuff like that and in no movie has it got any sort of scene like that or like no yeah they said there's nothing like, like that. it yeah mm. um i feel like it's a bit of a cop out if i'm honest mm. to say like oh it must just be down to the media and down to video game mm, it's a bit of a cop out no they did what they did hold them accountable and stop finding an ex- excuse like yeah yeah some British tabloids claim that the attack on Bulger was inspired by the film Child's Play 3, which is chucky, as far as I'm aware. And they then campaigned for rules of video nasties to be tightened. During the investigation, it emerged that Child's Play 3 was one of the films that John Venable's father had rented in the months prior to the killing. But it wasn't established that Venable's had actually ever seen the film. A Merseyside detective at the time said, we went through something like 200 titles rented by the Venables family. There were some films that you or I just wouldn't see, but nothing where you could put the finger on the freeze button and say that influenced the boys to go out and commit murder. So, I mean, I don't really, other than that scream murder, yeah, you know, where the two boys killed I the girl. I get it. You, like, you see it all the time, like you don't see it all the time, but like you see it like with high school massacres and stuff they're very into like violent video games a lot of the time Mm. and there are cases where that's a link but that's not to say the the video games are are the reason they've gone out and done that and it's the same when you look at like you know the triangle of what makes a serial killer like Mm. head trauma 
incest or whatever. I don't even know what they are. Yeah, but yeah. arson is the third one. Arson yeah, arson? yeah, yeah, yeah. Those things, yeah, they generally you can look at a serial killer and think, okay, they've got one or two of those traits. At that some mean, point in their childhood, that, that doesn't has mean happened. that's going to make yeah. you a murderer. No, and it doesn't mean that watching a violent video game is going to make you want to go out and do something this horrendous. As we've learned, because you watch all of these fucking horrible, <laughs> horrible scary films. And I don't hey, know how you do, I do it, that but you for, do it. I do that for safety. I'm not murdered yet. And as far as I'm aware, you've never murdered anyone, so... I haven't. I haven't. I know I wouldn't say I had. There you go. Considering this is going on the internet, but I can promise I haven't. Like, <laughs> I'm too scared so, yeah. of, like, authority to have murdered someone. <laughs> yeah. It's not, like, you can't say that these two things go hand in hand. But... No. I think people are, like, again, it's going back to that finding a scapegoat, finding a reason why these children did this. Yeah. God yeah, forbid yeah. that children actually are potentially just born evil. Yeah. But I think I can understand it in the sense of, like, they say, like, how, like, violent porn plays a massive thing mm. into especially boys' view on sex. And, mm. again, it can cause problems a lot of the time. But that's not to say that every child, or not every child, but every adolescent male to watch porn is going to end up being mm. a murderer or a rapist like it's just not certain things might influence certain people but it doesn't mean that it's the reason for it or the excuse yeah. for it yeah it's by using that excuse of oh well it's down to video games it's down to porn it's down to me you're take you're taking away the responsibility of the offender you're saying that, well, they can't possibly have done that. It must be another reason. No, stop, stop bullshitting. Yeah. They did what they did. You don't need to find some psychological term as to why. Mm. Or justification for it in any sense. Like, it's like the whole, um, what was that murder where the two boys, they were obsessed with the Scream franchise and they killed the girl? Yeah, we actually listened to a podcast on it. I can't remember yeah. what it is, but I've actually you'll, got you'll it know about to it do. Yeah, I've got it like to do for one episode. Um, but yeah, they were obsessed with the Scream franchise and they wanted to commit the perfect murder, which is the whole point of the Scream franchise. It's based on a on a serial killer in Texas, I think. Um, or not serial? He wasn't serial killer. He was mass murderer. Like that's the term for it, isn't it? But and maybe if the those movies didn't exist they wouldn't have committed this murder but you don't know like yeah you still... don't know that because yeah. there's still something wrong in your brain to think oh i'm gonna exactly. go do that i do you know i, I always love find the weird? screen movies but it doesn't it doesn't inspire me to go kill someone like do you know i always find weird this is a bit of a segue when people commit crimes with other people like groups of two or more mm. Who initiates that conversation? We've said this when we did the couples who kill. We were like, how can these two people find each other and have such, um, such like they are so on the same wavelength of something so, like so hor horrific as murder, especially child murder, and we can't even find normal boyfriends. Can you no? But can you imagine if like I came out to you and was like, um, so I watched Human Centipede the other day. Like, let's recreate it. Yeah, how do you feel about recreating that? Like, who the fuck? It's just, oh, uh, especially with yeah. the two boys that want to recreate Scream. Who the fuck goes up to their mate and was like, "Bruh, bruv, I watched Scream the other day." Yeah. And... <laughs> well, you should, Let me you know, tell are you. you thinking what I'm thinking. Yeah. No. Who does it that? It's just horrendous. Like, and it's bizarre the amount of people in this world. And even if you come from a small town, to find that one person on that same wavelength. That's just like a whole other thing. That's when I'd re I I would honestly think of something like supernatural, like demons bringing people together. You know what I mean? Mm. Like, because oh, I just it is bizarre. It, it's just crazy how I don't know. Yeah, you never understand it, will you? Yeah. Like, let's go back. The two boys, by then age eleven, were found guilty of James's murder at Preston Court on the 24th of November 1993. I should say Preston is like 45 minutes away from Liverpool and I imagine they had to move it there because of the attention in Liverpool this would have got. Mm, like there's just no way yeah. it could have been it, it could they could have carried it out there like yeah. 
on the 24th of November 1993, becoming the youngest convicted murderers of the 20th century. The judge, Mr Justice Morland, told Thompson and Venables that they had committed a crime of unparalleled evil and barbarity. Judge Morland sentenced them to be detained at Her Majesty's pleasure, with the recommendation that they should be kept in custody for a very, very many years to come. Mate, you've got to give a time frame. <laughs> Next sentence. Yeah, no, I know, but still. <laughs> <laughs> then recommending a minimum term of 10 years. At the close of their trial, the judge lifted reporting restrictions and allowed the names of the killers to be released, saying, I did this because of public interest overrode the interest of the defendants. There was a need for an informed public debate on crimes committed by young children. Sort of understand it. The fact that children can commit crimes needs to be talked about because shit like this happens when it isn't. Mm. You know what I mean? Sir David Omond later criticised the decision and outlined the difficulties created by it in his 2010 review of the probation services handling of the case. I mean, yeah, we can understand what the atmosphere was like, really, I think. It's hard, isn't it? Because you probably, you've never had to work with a case like that. So no. how do you know how to handle something like that? I mean, it's even... And again, it... like I've said a million times, hindsight is an excellent thing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And like, I can imagine the judge being on that case. You can't help but be enraged. Like, mm. I pet... I. Honestly, I don't understand how, mainly because I couldn't imagine doing it, defending something, someone who's done that. You yeah, I mean? it's like, hard, being a it? criminal defence lawyer, especially when you know they've done it. Like, mm. and it is—it's your job. Like, but I just, yeah, don't know. Maybe I'm just really too judgmental. <laughs> Maybe it's a good thing I didn't do law at uni. Yeah. <laughs> After the trial, Thompson was transferred and held at the Bar and Moss Secure Centre in Manchester, and Venables was detained at Vardy House, a small unit at Red Bank Secure Unit in St Helens. The boys received education, rehabilitation, and regular visits. They gained their GCSEs while imprisoned, and both both passed their A-level qualifications. The boys were reported to have suffered from PTSD, and Venables, in particular, was said to have experienced nightmares and flashbacks to the murder. It is weird though, isn't it? Because they're the first child killers of our time, really. And they're in a detention centre where there are kids who've probably in there for like theft or still crimes because they've been committed of it. But like it's in no way to the same level as those two boys. And you know what I was just thinking? I think that um, Thompson... Thompson says it later on like in his life he says like as much as I regret what I did I had a better life because Mm. he went to school and he got GCCs and he got A-levels and actually like they didn't have very good lives out there Mm. so it's uh, yeah I mean it's it's a hard one isn't it I know unfortunately we've talked about it before sometimes in certain situations adults in particular have more opportunities in prison than they do out of prison mm. like because you like as far as justify the ends isn't it? exactly as as far as far as i know you obviously know a bit more because you work in one but they have access to education and things like that and extracurriculars yeah. that might help them when they get out like to the extent yeah i definitely of, think it's like as when you like for me when i started working there it is a shock to the system to think that actually people I mean, it's not very common, and it doesn't happen a lot. For, and like for many people, it is a punishment. For, for some people, like they do go there because you get three hot meals a day. Yeah, it's a, it's a roof you over your head. On. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, for these boys, like they had the opportunity to gain their qualifications. They probably did extracurricular activities. Yeah, they did. Like I remember therapy, watching documentary, counselling, yeah. whatever. Yeah, they, they did. had a, probably had a lot of one-on-one interaction with staff and stuff. Like they probably had like. Not a better life, but, like... No, but it's, like, I watched a documentary on it last year and this detention centre where they were in, and they weren't in there at the point of this documentary, like, it it was a, very much a case of there was still staff who worked there that had met them, but, like, the, it's years and years later. 
they do like cooking classes and they mingle with all the boys like throughout the day um their bedrooms are bedrooms they're not cells like Mm. it's more like a boarding school almost yeah yeah um it is strange because obviously you can't keep kids in like derelict buildings and everything be like let's still teach you a lesson you know what i mean Mm. like and but it is it's strange like there were pictures drawings all over the walls like their families were allowed to come in like they could make their families meals and their families could come in and eat with them and Mm. I don't know, it's weird, isn't it? It is weird. In 1999, lawyers for Thompson and Venables appealed to the European Court of Human Rights, stating that the boys' trial had not been impartial since they were too young to follow proceedings and understand an adult court. The European Court dismissed their claim that the trial was inhumane and degrading treatment, but upheld their claim that they were denied a fair hearing by the nature of the court proceedings. On the 15th of March, 2000... Um, 2000... On the 15th of March 1999, the court in Strasbourg ruled by 14 to 5 votes that there had been a violation of Article 6 of the European Convention of Human Rights regarding the fairness of the trial. In addition to this, the Strasbourg court ruled that the Home Secretary cannot and should not have any say in when young children convicted of murder should be freed as the sentencing must be reserved for the body or figure independent of the government. This European court case led to the new Lord Chief Justice reviewing the minimum sentence. In October 2000, he recommended the tariff be reduced from 10 years to 8 years. And in June 2001, the parole board ruled that these boys were no longer a threat to public safety and could be released as their minimum tariff had expired. In fact, and this is possibly the most ridiculous quote of them all, I know, there's been a few. In 2000... Child psychiatrist Sir Michael Rutter claimed that Venables posed a trivial risk to the public upon release. It's also suggested by the parole board that the chances of Venables successfully rehabilitating into the community were described as very high. And we're going to get on to why that is just quite so ironic in a minute. I was going to say, was Venables the one that came out and actually didn't, let's, let's put it this way, didn't cause trouble? Or was that Thompson? No. Okay, that was Thompson. So they're saying Venables. Up. They're saying Venables has got a trivial risk to the public. He's gonna rehabilitate himself. He's gonna go back into the community. No problem whatsoever. But of course, he's not. Anyway, yeah. we'll get onto it. They were released uh, lifelong licenses after serving eight years. Both men, yes, they're now officially men, were given new identities with new passports, national insurance numbers, and they were moved under witness protection. They weren't quite free, though, as they still had to give daily reports back to their probation for their actions. So that's lifelong. They have to give... They're on a lifelong license. under the probation, yeah. So what are they giving them passports for? You're allowed to go on holiday. Are you? On probation? Are you? So a lifelong license... I thought you couldn't leave the country until you were out No, you can eventually. You can eventually. A lifelong license is... if, If... if you breach your license conditions, you're going back to prison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, the terms of their release, their license conditions were as follows. They were not allowed to contact each other or the Bulger family, obviously. Yeah. They were prohibited from visiting Merseyside and they must report to probation officers and obviously they had a daily curfew. An injunction was imposed on the media after the trial, which prevented the publication of details about Thompson and Venables. The new worldwide injunction was kept in force following their release in order to protect their new identities and their location. Uh, This is currently still in force. So um, this means, and it's important to remember this, that if you post a photo or claim that you know where Thompson and Venables is or try to find out their identities, their addresses, you actually run the risk of going to prison still, seriously. Yeah, yeah. This is going on as well. I act, like the last person I could find was this 53-year-old woman in January last year, who received a 15-month suspended prison sentence for uploading a photo onto Facebook claiming it was Venables. So it's still happening. Oh yeah. But you, uh, you was... can genuinely still go to prison for it. Yeah, there was a man in Scotland in a little village in Scotland, and he'd, he'd moved there 10 years previous. He got so much harassment and things 
by people claiming that he was Venables in particular. Mm. He killed himself. Mm. People were like, they just made his life hell and it wasn't him. Like, mm. he had proof. He had, like... And I understand they give you passports and things like that, but he had, like... He had proof that it wasn't him. He showed them child photos that it couldn't have been him. Everything... Did everything he possibly could to prove that it wasn't him. And he ended up killing himself in the end because people just wouldn't let go. Yeah. They just wouldn't let go. And whether you agree with the sentencing or not, they served their sentence. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And I realise we go on a bit more to maybe why one of them in particular should be kept in for longer, if not for the rest of their lives. But... But I don't know, you can't become a vigilante. Like I know, yeah, it's true. But it also just it, it reminds you, you've got to be careful what you're posting on social yeah, media. Yeah, yeah. There's no, like, it's not, none of this, like, free you speech think this happens, argument. This happened 28 years ago. Yeah. You can't say, oh, well, it's free speech, I can say what I want. Not if you're inciting riot and violence, you can't. Just mm. to name a few things, like... Free speech comes under conditions, lovely. <laughs> so, let's discuss Venables and Thompson's after release. So, it seems from all of Grace's research that despite what is popularly known as the instigator of the Bulger murder and the ringleader, Robert Thompson had stayed out of trouble and since his prison sentence has led a law abiding life. Well, if he hasn't, he's not been caught yet, like... Well, yeah. He is, according to all reports, settled and in a relationship with a man who knows about his real identity. But does that not go against the junction of saying, talking about talking about them now, or is that purely trying to find their identity now? You know what I mean? Uh, I don't know. That's a good question, because they... I guess it's, like, from sources... So you're not trying to find out their new identity and you're not trying to find out where they live. So I think those are the two key things that you can't... So maybe they've spoken to like a cousin or something and said, yeah. how are they doing now? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Venables, on the other hand, well, that's where it gets a little bit more complicated. Yeah. Venables began living independently in March 2002. Sometime after that, he began a relationship with a mo- woman who had a five-year-old child. And it's not known whether he had already begun downloading child pornography at the time of the relationship or if it was after this relationship fell through. But it's important to note that he denies ever having met the child. How? How? I don't know I don't how know. long Some people he was don't in a relationship. Do it, do they? Yeah. Some people don't do it, though. They, like, wait a year or two for you to meet your child. Ah, oh, sorry, I just stubbed my toe on my desk. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, I don't know how long the relationship lasted or anything like that. But I mean, I, I personally wouldn't know because I'm not yet mature enough to date someone who already has a child. <laughs> yeah, and I don't definitely don't have one just yet. <laughs> yeah, so who knows? But some people wait a long time, don't they? Yeah. Which is understandable. Yeah. In 2005, when Benables was 23, it's mad. I always think about it being like, well, in 2005, they're probably going to be, like, 40. <laughs> like, Do you? Even though, like, I just imagine them being so much older. Like, I don't know. I think it's just in my head because I still comp- can't comprehend that a 10-year-old did this. Yeah. So I just imagine they're going to be so much older when we talk about them. Do you know mm. what I mean? Like, but in reality... Actually, yeah, they are older than my sister, but, like, not much older. Do you know what I mean? She's definitely not in her 40s. Like, mm. I mean, they probably are now, but... Anyway, yeah, back to it, yeah. In 2005, when Venables was 23, his probation officer met another girlfriend who was 17 at the time. After a number of young girls, quote, it was presumed that Venables was having a delayed adolescence, something which we can kind of understand seeing as he was imprisoned at the age of 11. Yeah, because I think... And I'm no psycho. I'm not an expert, and I'm not a psychologist. But from what I've learned from working within prisons, mm. is that not all the time, but sometimes you meet people, and it's like they've stopped mentally growing from the time they've come into prison to now. Yeah, it's like they're. And you see, it, especially with like lifers, 
if they they become imprisoned at like what 17 18 19 whatever or they're now in their 30s and you can like see see it you can well, yeah, f- hear not, it when you talk to them yeah they're not going through that uh, that transition period throughout their life of mm. it's like the stages isn't it so you go through school you then go through university or or don't but like you have these life moments that happen and age 10 to 20 are probably your biggest years of growing like mm. that's literally in those 10 years your child and an adult like in the in that whole period and they've missed out on those life not achievements, but like, you know what I mean? Like those moments in their life that's gonna cause them to grow up to being an adult. They've been in this isolated area. So I know what you mean. Like when they come out, he's probably still of a young age in his head. Like he's just, Mm. he's not experienced anything. Like, um, I mean, it's the consequence of it, isn't it? Like of their Mm. actions. Yeah. Supervision on Venables began to reduce over time. And when this happened, he began drinking heavily, taking drugs, downloading child pornography, and actually moved to Merseyside, which is something I've been told by people who live here. Like, he Mm. went into a pub, told everyone who he was, and was then... People beat the shit out of him. Like... Oh, sorry. Okay. (laughs) Read the next sentence, yeah. I think that's what you're talking about. Yeah. In September 2008, Venables was arrested on suspicion of a fray, basically a public order offence consisting of fighting in a public place. However, he compl- claimed that it was self-defence and just had to complete a alcohol awareness course. On two separate occasions, he's also revealed his true identity. Because he's a fucking I mean, moron! So, sorry, but does that junction from... Uh, not allowing people to reveal their identity not apply to the people themselves yeah. does it go all the way to you can i s- yeah. can you are sue you, yourself are you exempt from this <laughs> technically you have a new identity so you're a different person so are you not exempt i don't know i don't i can't there's no way for me to explain it yeah oh sorry hang on that's just me being petty by the way i don't actually know whether that's a thing or not <laughs> like... i mean no but there's just no way for you to like think why would you ever tell anyone that? He like genuinely he must have something going on mentally. He must be proud like, of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, on the 7th of March 2010, Venables returned to prison accused of child pornography offences. In June of that year, Venables was charged with possession and distribution of indecent images of children. It was alleged that he had downloaded 57 indecent images of children over the last 12-month period and had allowed others to view these files through a peer-to-peer network. He pleaded guilty to the charges and was given a two-year sentence. A pretty fucking small sentence, if you ask me, but that's just my opinion. Well, it is, because the judge but, would you know see it all his the time. history. Things like child yeah. pornography and stuff. I was actually... Did I, did I mention it in, my last, in the last podcast? That I was watching this... I was watching this documentary. Yeah, I did oh, mention yeah, it. Oh, yeah, you did. Yeah, about, yeah, yeah. I still pedophiles and like yeah. unless you physically do something they can't catch yeah. you yeah so how did he get caught well at a court hearing it emerged that Venables had contacted his, his probation officer in February 2010 fearing that his new identity had been compromised at his place of work probably because he fucking told someone yeah when the officer arrived at his flat Venables was attempting to remove and or destroy the hard drive of his computer using a butter knife I don't why would you use a butter knife but okay I'm not here to judge the method in the madness hun. obviously this raised suspicions because the probation officer thought well, why the fuck are you trying to cut your hard drive out of your computer yeah. so the probation officer examined it and obviously it was child porn on it because what else would you put on a computer honestly mm. I can't comprehend so I'm not going to go into details of the type and graphicness is that a word? graphicness? Graphiticness. <laughs> <laughs> but it was fucking horrendous. Okay, that's all we're going to say. So he was given another identity in May 2011 while serving the sentence. So that's more of our money. Yeah, how Spent much does him. it cost to give someone a new identity? I couldn't, I couldn't even give you... I honestly couldn't even give you a figure. Thousands. Tens of thousands. Yeah. 
Um, in September thir 2013, he was released from prison on this sentence. But on November 2017, it was reported that Venables had yet again been recalled to prison for possession of child abuse imagery. Venables pleaded guilty to possession of indecent images for children for a second time. He admitted to being in possession of 392 Category A photos, 148 Category B, and 630 Category C. So obviously, I mean, if like, it, I would love for no one to know what this is, but you, they, like, there are separate, there are categories to child pornography on how. Yeah, we've spoken about this before. Yeah, what's happening? Blah blah blah. So yeah, they're all categorised, which is probably the worst job I could ever think of in the world. Mm. But, but yeah, so he got a three-year imprisonment sentence for this, and in September 2020 he was denied parole, and he still remains in prison to this day under an alias. So who knows? Yeah, where he is, what he's doing. He's in prison somewhere. The amount of fucking prisons in this country, which is kind of nice. It's kind of a nice like like he's in prison. It's okay. at least he's away. Yeah. Um, in 2019, this would be a little bit of a fun tidbit for you. It was reported that British officials had considered resetting Venables in either Canada, Australia, or New Zealand due to the high costs of continually protecting his autonomy. According to a report, the British authorities have spent £65,000 in legal fees to keep Venables' identity a secret. However, uh, New Zealand Prime Minister. <laughs> remarked that Venables would need an exemption under the Immigration Act and that he, quote, shouldn't bother applying. I fucking love her, you know. She is probably my favourite, favourite leader, honestly. I just yeah, want to don't bother me because I don't want you in my country. Yeah, like... <laughs> and the fact that she says it, she says stuff like this, and you know she's being, like, not petty because that's the wrong word, but, like... She's saying she's things fact. nicely, but it's yeah, like, yeah. It's like, yeah, just tell you think about it. Yeah. Yeah. Like I think I saw an interview with her and it was like, um she it was something like, What how do you feel now that uh Trump's gone and Biden's in? And she's like, mm, Well, obviously I can't really comment on another country's political movements or anything, but it might be nice to get something done for once. <laughs> I was just like, I fucking love you, love. Yes. Like, Keep going. Like it's still politically correct, but it's also like, oh, let's stick a knife in there. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you've titled this like happy ending question mark. What will we? Mm. Question mark. Like these are just my conclusions. We're yeah. nearing the end of this podcast. Yeah. So Denise and Rolf, who are James's parents, split up and divorced in 1995 after tirelessly fighting against their son's killers i mean you can't even imagine like yeah being in that situation like that's just horrendous mm. denise remarried stuart fergus and they have two sons together ralph also remarried nestle mcdermott since and had three daughters with his second wife james's father ralph continues to campaign for the lifting of venables and thompson's anonymity stating that it is a failed experiment I mean, it's definitely failed in Venable's situation. Yeah. I mean, is it failed in Thompson's? I don't know. Mm. Like, Denise released a book called I Let Him Go to mark the 25th anniversary of James's death in 2018. In the book, she writes, I will continue to do all I can for James until there's no breath left in my body. He will always be my son and I will protect him and his memory forever. The fight continues. It just changes as the years go on. I got shivers again. <laughs> <laughs> Since James's death, the James Bulger Memorial Trust has been created to benefit and support young people who are disadvantaged by having become victims of crime, hatred, or bullying. That's nice. Yeah. It's just, I just hate this case. I know it's, it breaks your heart, doesn't it? And I think I just. It's just horrible, but... It's just awful. Like, there's literally no two ways about it. It's just fucking awful. It's also... But it's just it's just interesting, isn't it, to look yeah. at? It is interesting how... as well when you're interested in, like, the criminal mind and stuff, but, like... From, like, a criminality point of view, like, um... 
looking at children who kill children. It's very interesting isn't it because you there's mm. so many arguments of like nature versus nurture nature versus what <laughs> nature versus nurture yeah um and like cases like this you can really like dig into it mm. so it is interesting but yeah it's horrible but it's yeah. done now everyone thank fuck for that that's always been yeah. on our list since we started this i know yeah but ah uh. Damn it. I'm not going to sleep tonight. Um, so, yeah, that's it. It's a long one for once. Yes. We haven't done a long one in a while, have we? Um, it's silly to say that we hope you enjoyed because there's no way you can... F- well, if you do find enjoyment out of this, please go get help. But we hope you right. enjoyed <laughs> us talking, our voices. Yes. yes. And us taking the piss out of John Venables. Yes. Um, that's that's very important in this case. You need to yeah. be able to take the piss out of someone. Definitely. Um, yeah. If you did like this, please go and review us and like and subscribe and all the usual shite on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And also maybe give us a cheeky follow on Instagram. It's at everything with the girls pod. Um, and let us know any other cases that you want us to do. I did do a little uh, questionnaire thing yesterday. Well, it won't be yesterday when you're listening to this, but so let's say a few weeks ago. And I've saved it to our highlights, so hopefully, hopefully you can still um, join in on that. I'm not sure how it works on highlights. I don't know if that works like that. I don't know. Yeah. If not, the questions Maybe. are still on there. Just throw throw off a direct message. I'll, I'll answer in it. It'll still help. Yeah, um, I fucking love how your mum put on because uh, I put on a little box being like, "Would you ever consider paying?" Like, I'm doing a subscription. Your mum was the only one answer saying yes. Yeah. So I was like, "Oh my god, I love you, <laughs> <laughs> mum." Lydia wants you to adopt her. Please. <laughs> I can only say that because I know my own mother doesn't listen to this. <laughs> I know. I, me- I message my mum because I'm like I'm moving back home. Yeah, I messaged my mum and I was like, um, "Are you still excited for me?" <laughs> She's like, "Yes, with the love heart emoji eyes." She's so cute. I love her. Have a fantastic week, everybody, and we um, shall see you next week with another episode. Yeah, yeah hopefully bye. it won't be as horrendous. Bye. Yeah, sorry, yeah. I interrupted you and said bye then. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>